These stories are tales that have once been on the channel and have been removed by myself for one reason or another. I feel it's time to give them a second life. Welcome to the archives. I don't feel like I'm a nosy person. No more nosy than the next guy. I just have what my ma would call an unhealthy amount of curiosity. I was the kid who climbed to the top of the big oak in the backyard just to see what was in the crow's nest. I was the kid who dug a hole in the backyard so deep that I hit groundwater because I was convinced there was a cave under our house and I just wanted to see it. My folks aren't dirt poor but they're pretty close. They're part of that missing middle of America. The people who work 40 hours a week until they die with no savings to speak of. I got my first job at a horse stable when I was 14. It didn't last very long. I knew I needed to get a job because I knew we needed the money. So I bounced around for the next few years, washing dishes, waiting tables, till I graduated high school. Pop was really tough on me about college. He never went, actually nobody in his family had. So there were a few fights about where I would go after school. It was a huge shock to me when, just after graduation, he drove me down to the uni. He'd been classmates with the dean and they'd come up with the arrangement where I'd get a full scholarship provided I made good grades and worked for the university. I never felt like a scholar. In high school, I kept my head down and did enough to get by, pulling off B's and a few C's. I wasn't interested in learning, because learning wasn't interesting. Uni was different, though. I took mainly core classes, math, English, history, science, but they were fascinating. For one thing, nobody cared if I showed up or not. It was entirely up to me to succeed. So I did. In exchange for my education, I worked security and did some light maintenance duties. Maintenance was a no-brainer. I've always been handy and most of the fix-it jobs were the type that could be solved with a liberal application of WD-40 or elbow grease or both. Security, now, <laughs> that was a different story. Security gave me superpowers. You see, the job itself was pretty easy. I got a uniform, a badge, a flashlight, and Ma gave me some keychain mace for my birthday. No, I didn't get a gun. They weren't allowed on campus anyway. I worked mostly nights and weekends and doubles during long holiday breaks. I was to walk around the full campus twice in a night, checking the labs, computer center, and library. The rest of my time was pretty much my own. There were two other guards, Jake and Al, but they worked different shifts from me. We had overlap nights on Wednesday nights where we'd get together for about an hour to discuss any major events or changes. There might have been some beer at those meetings, but I'm underage and you know what, you can't prove anything. Jake worked mostly day shift and Al worked swings and some overnights during the week. Jake was a younger guy training to be on the local police force, so he took his job pretty seriously. On the other hand, I'm pretty sure Al mostly slept during his shifts. Al was two years older than Dirt, so he deserved his rest. Remember that bit I just said about superpowers? Yeah, my first night on the job, Al gave me a huge keychain with about a thousand keys on it, it weighed nearly five pounds and was secured to my belt with a heavy-duty metal chain. Don't lose that keychain, kid, Al said. You got keys to the kingdom right there. Any door that don't open, you don't want to go in it. My work hobby. The thing that kept me awake on those long, cold winter break nights was exploring. I made it a point every night to open some door that I've never opened before. I started in the news section where the library and computer center were, 
opening each room, each closet, making a map in my head of where everything was. Some nights, I might explore two or three rooms. Some nights, I might not have time for anything more than an odd, out-of-the-way broom closet. The uni is actually a pretty large campus. For having a full student body of only 12 or 1300, it was built as a Methodist college in 1896 and became state-owned in the 30s. There were three main sections. The old school housed the administration offices and a few unlucky classrooms, unlucky due to the lack of central heat and air, and the three-story building had no elevators. The labs were a brutalist horror of poured concrete slabs and tiny windows, built back in the 70s when buildings that looked like Soviet radiators were in style. The new library was steadily losing its new, built in the late 90s boom, and made in that unique red brick and glass style like everything else during those years. When I think back to those early days, those days before, I think how stupid I was, how naive. I should have thought about winter. I should have thought about the solstice. By December of my sophomore year of college, I had cleared every room in the new library. I had opened every door, checked every closet, and had a good mental map of the whole building. It was ultimately pretty unimpressive. I found no buried treasure, no secret stash of missing computer supplies cached in a forgotten closet. I did find a small, sweaty stack of bad porno mags in a supply closet in the basement level. Wicked, wicked cowgirls. Well, you know, who was I to judge? December is a slow time for the uni. After the mad rush of finals, the campus was suddenly deserted. The remaining few staff seemed lost. The building stood silent and dark in the thin winter breezes. We had a steady series of snowstorms, but none bad enough to close the campus. I made sure the sidewalks were clear and the entryways salted and otherwise tried to stay indoors. Besides, I had the old school to explore. The main old building, Downing Hall, was a four-story V-shaped building. It had no elevators, tiny stairwells, and was only exempted from ADA compliance due to its historical importance. It had no air conditioning, save for sporadic window mount units that were only permitted to be installed on the rear of the building so as not to spoil the building's historic charm. The building's heat came from a massive ancient boiler in the basement. As far as I knew, Al was the only person who knew anything about the boiler, and he must have kept it in good shape because I never heard of any complaints about it. I spent the second week after finals week poking through the top floors of Downing Hall, I didn't have a lot of time for exploring every night, as the snow gave me more than usual upkeep chores, but I made steady progress. I discovered a small room in the attic on the left wing that must have been an old dean's office, complete with a beautiful antique desk and wardrobe. I checked both, thinking I might find something historic to give to the dean. But the wardrobe was empty, save for a moth-eaten wool scarf, and the desk's contents were limited to a few old newspapers and some tax forms from the 1950s. A level below, on the building's fourth floor, I found two dozen small, empty classrooms. In my handyman mindset, I checked the windows for loose glass panes and for water or rodent damage. I fully expected to see rat droppings or at least some insect damage, but I found none. 
The second and third floors were much the same, except the rooms on the rear of the building were air-conditioned and thus actively used for classes when school was in session. The main floor was administration, and included the dean's office. I thought it wise not to snoop around in my boss's office or in payroll, so I skipped a lot of these rooms. I made my way to the stairwell to the basement, used my superhero keychain, opened the heavy door, and went down. The basement of Downing Hall was different from that of the new library. For one thing, it was a lot more cramped. The hallway was narrow, and the ceiling was low, with doorways leading off at regular intervals. I checked every room, flipping the old two-button switches to on, using my flashlight on the dark corners. I had carried a few packs of spare light bulbs, you know, the fancy new CFC bulbs, in my satchel, thinking to replace any that had burnt out, and save the environment while I was at it. The little rooms mostly contained junk. Spare desks, filing cabinets full of 40 and 50 year old papers, old holiday decorations and so forth. It was lit by naked hanging bulbs. Now I'm not an imaginative kind of guy. I guess I'm pretty smart. I'd made straight A's in my college courses. It never occurred to me to be scared. So I didn't think, hey, I'm alone in a creepy old basement. This was my place, my job, my hobby, and it all seemed so normal. By the night of the 20th of December, I had made my way to the boiler room. The furnace was a massive monstrosity of iron and rivets, pipes and gauges. It was hellishly hot in that room and equally loud. It was, however, neat and very clean. Al kept it that way because he said, a clean boiler lets you get more shut eye. The furnace had been converted from coal to gas at some point, but the soot had stained the walls of the room, and the old coal chute still opened in one of the corners. I had no intention of giving the boiler room more than a glance. I'd been there dozens of times, and there was nothing to see, just a workbench and the furnace itself. When I noticed a small door to the back and left behind the furnace. Huh, that's weird, I thought to myself. I'd never seen that door before. But then again, I'd never stood in that particular spot beside the workbench, and I had never really looked. The door was smaller than a normal door, maybe five feet tall, painted in the same non-colored drab gray-brown of the walls and was made of metal, just like the other doors in the basement. I went over to the door and touched the handle. I think the body knows something when things are wrong. Have you ever had that feeling like you're being watched? When you know you're totally alone and nobody can see you, but you feel eyes on you? Have you ever gone left instead of right because you had a feeling that you just shouldn't go to the right today? It didn't work that way for me. When I touched that doorknob, nothing felt any different. My head didn't hurt, my neck hairs didn't stand up, and I didn't hear an inner voice saying, Don't do it. The doorknob turned, but the door wouldn't open. I looked more closely and saw a small keyhole. I checked my magic keychain and found three possible matches. Struck out on the first two. And the third worked, of course. The hinges squealed like they hadn't been used in a long time. My handyman instincts noted it. WD-40, I mumbled. I hauled open the door and stepped through, into another small, cramped hallway. The light switch worked, and the single bulb blew with a crack. 
Damn it. My hackles did raise then. I flicked on my flashlight and quickly swapped out the old hallway bulb with the new one. I looked around and saw this hallway was narrow, straight, and ended a few yards away at another door. That door opened easily onto another stairway. What the hell? I said. Nobody had ever mentioned a sub-basement for this building. The hairs on the back of my neck were still standing out. I shook it off his nerves from the blown bulb and walked into the stairwell. It was a standard stairwell and looked pretty much the same as the others in the building. I walked to the bottom and met another door. I pushed through it to see another long, narrow hallway with doors leading off to either side at regular intervals. The first door to my left was unlocked and opened fairly easily onto a storage closet. There were stacks of late 60s era books, a few desks, and a decaying mop in its bucket. The door across from it was unlocked, but did not open so easily. I hauled the door open to find a larger room that looked to have been used as a classroom. There were desks, a blackboard, anatomical diagrams, and posters on the walls. Everything was covered in an inch of dust and appeared to have not been touched in a long time. Why would anyone put a classroom down here? I mumbled to myself. How would they even convince students to get down here in the first place? I remember thinking at that point that I must somehow discover a back way into the other wing of the V-shaped downing hall. Maybe this is where the old science classes were held before the labs were built. I moved on to the next set of rooms. They were both classrooms, abandoned, dust-covered, and mostly empty. So were the next pair and the next. I saw a total of 12 disused classrooms in that hallway and a small break room complete with a lonely coffee pot. I also found two small restrooms. I didn't spend much time checking them out as the lights didn't work and I didn't feel like replacing those bulbs. I found myself getting slightly nervous. I was in a strange section of the campus and I was working alone that night. In the back of my mind, I just couldn't truly justify the existence, the waste, of a whole floor full of unused classrooms. When I got to the end of the hallway, I met another steel door. I opened it and saw another stairwell. I was fully expecting the stairwell to go up to connect to one of the other main stairwells in Downing Hall. The stairs only went down. This was the point, I remember, at which I began to get scared. No way. There's no way these stairs go down. How would anybody get down here? Here, here, here. The stairwell echoed at me. I should have checked the time. I should have been concerned with finishing my rounds. I should have been hungry for lunch, and I should have run. I started to climb down the stairs. The stairwell was unlit and appeared to be much older and in much worse condition than the others. It was also longer, much longer. After a few minutes of walking down the steps, I began to count them. At every 12 steps, there was a small landing, a turn, and another set of steps. Down. After 10 landings, I reached another door. It was unlocked and opened easily. The hinges squealed, and the echoes died like lost things in the dark. 
I groped against the left wall for a light switch, and there was none. I checked the right, and the wall was equally smooth. I cast the flashlight around, but saw nothing. Nothing forward, nothing to either side, and nothing above. I snapped my fingers, listening for the echo. I may or may not have heard one. I slowly came to realize that the room into which I had entered was enormous, cavernous, possibly the biggest room I had ever physically experienced. I shrank back to the doorway for a moment. This room can't be here, I said to myself. I started to think about going back. But I also started to think about wanting to know what was in there. I took a step forward, and another, until I was walking steadily into the room. I kept a steady pace, counting my steps. I looked over my shoulder every few yards, using the light from the open doorway to orient myself. I walked slowly for a hundred yards. 200 yards, until I saw a dim glow ahead. The glow got faintly brighter and larger as I walked toward it. Another 100 yards, and another, and three more passed until I could make out a small dim light bulb near a door. That door was of a different type entirely. It was huge, 14 feet tall at least, and half again as wide. The surface was black metal studded with rivets and bolts, mounted on huge hinges. Across the face of the door, graved into the metal, were words in some strange lupin script that I could not recognize. Every surface was carved with that script were with strange diagrams made of splayed, circle-ended lines. In the center of the door was a large, spoked wheel lock, and in the center of the lock was a tiny keyhole. Above the keyhole was a sigil, enclosed in three circles. I looked behind me and could not see the light from the stairwell. In fact, I couldn't see anything at all. I held the superhero keychain to the dim light and flipped through the keys. Of course, there was one small, battered key that looked as if it might fit. I inserted it into the lock and turned it. I heard a click and a thud and a sound from within the door like pouring pebbles or dry teeth. I pulled the key from the lock and grasped the spokes of the wheel lock. My heart was racing and sweat was dribbling into my eyes. I turned the spokes to the left, counterclockwise. Wider shins, some buried memory in my head said, and kept turning until the wheel stopped. There was another thud and a crack and then silence. The darkness behind me no longer felt empty. In fact, it felt positively crowded, as if I had an audience watching me. I stepped back from the door and flashed my light around. Still nothing. Dry, empty floor. I turned back to the door, grasping the large cast iron handles and pulled. Nothing. I tried harder, putting all my weight into the pole, and at the last moment, at the end of my strength, I heard another crack, and the door groaned open on a draft of cool, stinking air. The smell was heavy, moist, and musky. I had a flash memory of my mother taking me to the zoo as a child, and the smell of the cat house with the lions. At the thought of the lions, I let go of the handles and stumbled back a bit. I carefully shone my light into the yawning black crevasse of the open door. I saw a short, 
hallway that opened into a small cramped room. I saw a filthy rusted metal chair. I saw bones, small bones. I saw or heard or smelled a form so black it seemed to suck in the light of my flashlight. I saw a black form rushing toward me, running towards me, filling the hallway, howling and laughing and speaking in a voice that sounded like mountains collapsing. I remember fangs and words that turned my bones to rusted glass. I remember feathers and a hand with too many fingers, jeweled with something unspeakable, and the smell, the stink of something long caged. I remember wings. I don't know how long I wandered in the dark, alone under hundreds of feet of rock. There was no light. There was no way to judge time. My flashlight was dead. And my cell phone. And even the small specks of luminescent paint on my cheap wristwatch were dark. There was something wrong with my right leg. It hurt. But I couldn't see enough to find out why. I kept hearing my audience there in that cavernous room. I screamed at them. I felt one of them touch my face, and I threw my flashlight at it. The flashlight bounced and rattled and became still, somewhere that I was not. Something laughed. Later. I raved and screamed, but didn't throw anything else. I found the doorway after hours or days of crawling. There were no lights in the stairwell. After years of climbing, I crawled into that first forgotten hallway. I sliced my fingers on the crushed remains of the light bulbs I had packed in my satchel. I crawled down the hallway and reached the next stairwell. I hauled myself up them and finally out into the boiler room. When I staggered out of Downing Hall, two full days after going in, it was into dim winter daylight in a full police presence. Five people had been found dead on and around the campus. All had been brutally, now savagely, murdered, bodies splayed open, viscera missing. The teeth marks suggested a wild animal, but the murder scenes and body positioning also displayed a certain intelligence to them. There was also the writing, carved into the flesh when it was not yet dead meat. The cops wouldn't talk about the writing. The cops wouldn't talk to me either. Not afterwards. When they first saw me stumble out into the daylight covered in blood, they assumed I was the perpetrator. They quickly changed their assumptions when the medics pointed out that the green stick fracture, the dehydration, the concussion, and the obvious shock. The cops asked a lot of questions, and I answered as best I could. I told them about the door in the boiler room. They couldn't find it. They showed me the bare, smooth wall from where I had crawled, dazed and broken. My tracks stopped at that wall. Two cops tried breaking through the wall in that spot, only to meet old brick and older earth past that. The cops wanted to know where the long black feathers came from, stuck to my clothes, by dried blood. I didn't know. I didn't want to know. The cops, the medics, nobody would look at me anymore. The scars on my face, the deep, gouged out writing, was not a sight that most would want to see. I was marked. Whatever I had let out, whatever had killed and eaten five people, 
and a week later six more had marked me as a friend. There are some stories that should never be told, tales that should never see the light or reach the eyes of the weak-hearted, innocent, frail. I relate this to you only in the hopes of protecting others from the same fate my friends fell to. College, supposed to be fun and interesting, a time of growing friendships and budding relationships and coming into our own, at least that's what I expected. The year started out so calmly, or as calm as one might expect the transition from high school to college can be. I managed to meet some wonderful friends, together comprising a group of seven. Seven silly, fun-loving, closely connected students drawn together. I remember the night everything began all too clearly. I can remember Miranda, Hannah, Shane, and I were eating at the Quidoba, a common last resort eating place when the cafeteria was crowded or closed. Miranda and I are quite similar in nature, introverted and shy, and your typical rule followers. Hannah has a bit more outgoing often prone to making those startlingly smooth sexual jokes and not as much as a goody two-shoes as Miranda and I tended to be. Shane was that influential friend who is aggravatedly adept at getting you to do what he wants, be it good or bad. We were eating dinner, laughing, and talking about Shane's excursions into an abandoned and closed-off insane asylum. He was relating tales of the experience and sharing pictures and videos of the demolished architecture. We started talking about the tunnels that ran underneath the old, worn-down amphitheater, which sat empty and forgotten behind the building which housed the math department. I remembered sitting on the stone seats earlier that year in a class meeting with the professor. There had been such a strange atmosphere surrounding the amphitheater then, and it sent a chill down my spine. Shane mentioned how one of his friends, Dan, had delved into the tunnels earlier in the year, boasting about it as if it were a rite of passage. We laughed, and trying to be brave and fearless, I claimed I could easily sneak down there without a problem. I ended up making a promise that would change my life forever. It was late one spring night, and I was spending the evening in Shane's dorm room alongside Sean and Megan and Alexis. Sean was the loyal brother bear of the group, one of the most supportive guys you'd ever meet. Megan was incredibly smart, a hard worker, and with a soul too pure for this world. Alexis was silly and classy, with a laugh that always managed to bring up the rest of the group to stitches. Somehow, the conversation circled around to the tunnels once more. Shane told everyone else about Dan, and once again, I was confronted with the challenge to break into them. Had I known what I know now, I never would have agreed. I never would have laughed and pretended that I didn't have misgivings. It'd be fun, Shane said, adopting that smile that always managed to convince us. Yeah, I think it'd be pretty cool, I quickly added. Wouldn't it be awesome to see what's down there? The answer to that question is no. If only I had known it at the time. I don't think it's a good idea, Megan said, looking between Shane and I. I shared her mindset, but wasn't about to back down from my previous stance. As long as I'm not going alone, I'll be fine, I said, trying to lighten the conversation. 
And who the hell is going to go with you? Alexis interrupted, giving me an incredulous look. I laughed, trying to act like I wasn't that concerned. Okay, okay, alone then. But at least I'll have my flashlight taser on me. If anything tries to jump me, I'll tase it to death, I said with a chuckle, and while the others joined in my laughter, I could tell it wasn't entirely genuine. Everyone had an uneasy feeling about the situation, perhaps aside from Shane, who had gone on such an adventure once before. This wasn't to say they were scared. Dan had done it before and there was no reason to be so worried, but the idea was still unsettling. Alright, so when are we going to do this? Shane asked, returning his attention to me. Might as well get it done and over with, I said with a sigh, and while the weather is warm. This weekend? Shane suggested. I was taken aback, and my heart leaped for a moment, whether from excitement or dread. I cannot tell. Uh, works for me as long as you guys don't leave me down there, Shane joked. I still don't think we should, Megan said quietly, though she was drowned out by my own affirmation of the suggested time. We settled upon Saturday night, when the campus police would be too busy monitoring rooms for alcohol and drug use, watching for party-goers who might have broken the law, and patrolling for any issues along campus walk. When night had fallen, we met in my dorm and snuck out a back entrance slipping through the darkness to the amphitheater. We came upon the entrance to the tunnels, a heavy metal door that was thoroughly rusted and held shut by an old metal lock. It was easy enough to open, and before long, we were looking through the door into a long, dark hallway. Cold air wafted from the tunnels, bringing a strong odor of musty, moldy, decay. Oh my god, Alexis gagged and turned away from the door. My reservations became exceedingly clear. <laughs> I can't do this, I stated, taking a step back from the door hanging open. Nah, come on, Shane said, looking back to the tunnel. Dan already did this, it's fine. At that moment, a raccoon dashed from the tunnels and passed us, startling me. I let out a shout, scared by the sudden appearance of the creature. <laughs> Seriously, Mary? Sean said with a good-natured laugh. I'm jumpy, I exclaimed, blushing red with embarrassment. I didn't mention it at the time, but I had seen more than a raccoon run in front of us. It hadn't been the raccoon that had startled me. There had been two shadows. One had been significantly larger, much too large to be a raccoon. I tried to convince myself it had only been a mother and a baby. The hairs on the back of my neck still stood on end. Come on, just a few minutes and that's all, Shane begged, handed me my flashlight. I clasped it in my hands, trying not to show how shaky they were. All right, we'll be waiting for you out here, Miranda said, giving me a hug. I swallowed hard and nodded, afraid my voice would crack in fear if I tried to respond. I took a step toward the door, then another. My heart beat faster in my chest. The air was pungent. The batteries of my flashlight were low, and the resulting light was dangerously dim. Have you ever seen a horror movie and cringed at the stupidity of the main characters? I can remember constantly telling them not to do this, not to do that, aggravated and annoyed that they are making such basic and childish mistakes. Funny, how when you're in a situation like that, you never listen to your own instincts. Images of horrible creatures flooded my mind. but. I pushed them all back. What's the worst that I could run into? Spiders? I'm not afraid of those. Uh oh. How I wish I had been. 
I hesitantly entered the cavern. It was dark and damp, and as you might expect, a decades-old tunnel to feel. But there was something off. Something unnatural hung in the air. And I don't mean ghostly and supernatural. There was a strong sense of dread that washed over me. But just as every horror protagonist ever, I kept going. I ignored my instincts. I walked several hundred feet through until I came to a split, one to the left and one to the right. I quickly checked down both halls with my flashlight, half expecting to see some hideous nightmare creature looming from the darkness. Of course, I saw nothing. Both sides were equally unnerving, so I opted to move toward the left. It felt a little warmer in the left passage, and I came upon another branching path shortly. I turned left again, hoping I would be able to remember the way back. The air grew warmer. Geothermal energy? I thought to myself, trying to comprehend the sudden change in temperature, when suddenly there was a sickening crack beneath my feet. I turned my flashlight down and jumped back when I saw what I had stepped upon. There was a corpse of a rat, but it was unlike any corpse I had ever seen. Part of the bones were showing, where flesh had been dissolved off of them and left stark white. Other pieces were almost mummified, as if the natural decomposition process had been halted. The intestines were spilling out of a gash in the creature's stomach, as if it were a fresh wound. My breathing halted, and I began to feel overwhelmingly claustrophobic. I fought against the nausea that suddenly churned my stomach. That wasn't natural. Nothing about these tunnels was natural. Why was the pungent odor getting much stronger? Why did the air seem to be getting warmer? I raised my flashlight and froze. I don't remember if I was breathing or not. All I could think about was what had just been illuminated. There was a creature hunched down before me. Maybe the size of a medium dog or a fox or something like that. To say it looked humanoid would be not quite accurate. Its posture resembled a hunched over kid, but its head was a little too big for the body below it. Its eyes bugged out of its skull, taking up at least one third of the head itself. There was no color to them only dark black and an opaque, bluish covering. Long fangs extended from its mouth, but it lacked a lower jaw. A curled up tongue, similar to a proboscis of a butterfly, curled behind the fangs, hanging openly in the air. The claws that extended from its thick, thin limbs curved against the damp concrete beneath us. Every bone seemed close to protruding from the creature's skin, which was a sickly green color, as if it, too, were caught between decomposition and mummification. I couldn't move. Slowly, the creature turned its head to face me, leaning forward. The tongue uncurled and swept across the floor as if searching for a scent or abnormality. Creaking, like the sound of a door, emanated through the tunnel as it moved toward me, slowly and methodically. Its claws twitched slightly as it moved, the unlitting eyes pulsing. I was petrified, and I couldn't breathe. My entire being trembled in fear, but my brain seemed incapable of transmitting the signal to move. The adrenaline that rushed through my body couldn't force me to turn and run. The taser upon my flashlight was 
long forgotten. As it neared, the air grew increasingly warmer, as if inside the creature a small inferno was roaring. The rotten, decaying scent of death loomed closer, and suddenly my brain fixed the broken signal, and my body leapt into action. I turned on my heels and ran, thrown all caution to the wind. A screech echoed behind me, unearthly and ungodly, dying away into sounds eerily similar to the popping and cracking of a fire. I turned a corner, hearing the sound of something splattering against the wall beside me. There was a hissing noise, like gas being released from a tire, and my feet moved even faster. I turned a corner and saw the faint moonlight of the doorway, so much further than I had hoped. I dashed for the exit, calling out to Miranda, to Sean, to whoever was waiting for me outside. My brain didn't comprehend the fact that by running toward the exit, I was luring the creature to the people I cared about most. It didn't occur to me that the tunnels had been locked up for a reason other than trespassing college students. It had been bolted behind great iron doors to keep whatever that thing was locked away. And I released it. Run was the only thing I remember shouting. I recall the confusion on their faces as they shone their flashlights through the tunnels, the recognition as they saw me, and the dread as they laid eyes upon the nightmare behind me. They scattered, though I didn't see Megan, Hannah, or Alexis. I only fleetingly considered that. They had left early. I glanced behind me, as foolish people always do, to see if it was still chasing me. The creature had paused, clicking and creaking. At the doorway, I slowed, wondering if it couldn't cross the threshold. Then I saw the others. There was more than one. A whole colony of those things hiding away beneath our very school, unearthed by nobody other than me. Sean, Miranda, and Shane found me, pulling on my arms and yelling at me to move, to get out of there, but I was petrified again with all those giant black orbs trained on me. I was pulled back slowly toward my dorm when something crunched beneath my feet. I looked down. Megan's glasses. No, 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 no. I began to cry, feverish nonsense spilling from my lips. Miranda froze, staring down at the abandoned frames and broken lenses. No word could be spoken by anyone. Only Sean's pushing moved us from our paralysis, and by then the creatures had begun to spill out into the surrounding area. They paced a decent distance from us, back and forth like panthers about to lunge. Their movements jarred and shuddered, perhaps due to the sickening disproportion of their limbs. The hind legs were severely shortened, and the arms, including the claws at the end, were at least twice their size. We ran, and we ran as fast as we possibly could, but we couldn't beat them. I used to roll my eyes at the hero who sacrificed themselves for the rest of the group, who, in a situation like that, would know they all couldn't escape. How could they discern the danger so quickly and definitively, and who would be crazy enough to sacrifice themselves and embrace death? How foolish I was. Sean. Sean fought them off. He knew we all wouldn't be able to make it, yet Sean, loyal, protective Sean, turned toward the creatures and charged. I think I called his name. I can't remember. I 
was a coward. I didn't go back for him. I tried to make myself feel better by reasoning that his sacrifice was to give us more time to escape, that his death wasn't in vain. They swarmed him. I could tell that much from the sounds that assaulted my ears. I ran and ran, stumbling over everything I came across in my fervor. Then I almost tripped over something that made me stop dead in my tracks. There was a body, unrecognizable half bone and half mummified flesh, surrounded by a pool of dark red liquid. An overwhelming stench lingered in the air and I gagged. I heard the screeching again, echoing in my ears, and I heard Miranda shout Shane's name. I dared to look back and saw her a couple of feet behind me, watching in horror as the terrible scene unfolded. It's too difficult to describe what happened. My mind still cannot firmly grasp the reality of it, the sheer brutality of it. But I must mention the few important things I learned about these creatures. They possess an acid like venom they can shoot from their fangs that dissolves flesh into a soupy mess. Their tongues serve as straws to suck up the liquid left behind by the venom, and their body, with the heat it emanates, is used to keep untouched the flesh undissolved and free of decay. Sheer panic overwhelmed me. I grabbed Miranda's arm and dragged her along behind me. My dorm wasn't that far from the amphitheater, but it felt like miles clicking and creaking and howling and screeching echoed around us, though not as unanimous as before, as if several of them had fallen back. Their cries chased after us. We didn't stop until we had taken refuge behind the doors to my dorm. Miranda collapsed to the ground, breaking down into sobs and incomprehensible cries. I peered through the window of the door, attempting to catch my breath and fighting back the weariness that accompanied the fading adrenaline. They had stopped a couple feet back from the lights that illuminated the entryway, moving forward only to leap back with loud screams. Their eyes shrank noticeably when they came in contact with the harsh light, and the creatures began shaking their heads violently. I kept watching until with shrill shrieks, they gave up and faded away into the darkness. Their shuddering bodies melted into blackness. Someone discovered the bodies the next day. There was a fair amount of noise and concern created by the incident, but I avoided the scene as best I could. I texted every one of my friends in the vain hope that it had all been a dream. No answers. I beat upon their doors, sobbing, trying to awaken them. It was no use. They were gone and never to return. The police only barely recognized the bodies. Hannah and Alexis had been identified by fingerprints left upon the items they carried. Sean and Shane, well, I saw what happened to them. Megan was nowhere to be found, though her shattered glasses answers that question well enough. After that incident, I refused to be outside after dark, especially once the disappearances began. Students would vanish for several days, only to be found in remote places on and off campus, their bodies torn and dissolved just as just as my friends had been. They radiated outwards. Soon, the citizens of the town began to fall prey to those horrendous creatures. Police, after the incidents began to accumulate, began calling for the arrest and capture of somebody carrying knives and acid, or some other type of corrosive bioweapon. They'll never find the criminal. There's none to find. I know. Miranda knows. We are the only ones. 
Those creatures cannot be stopped. They have been trapped, contained, and now no longer. They're free to prey upon the human populations they come in contact with, and at the rate they're spreading. Huh. I transferred once the semester was over. I moved to the college in my hometown, and Miranda followed me. Neither of us wanted to remain on that cursed campus in that forsaken town. I share the story in hopes that helpless lives might be saved. Even if I must face the consequences of that terrible night, I beg of you, hear my plea. Don't go out at night. Don't travel without something to protect yourself, and please, if you hear creaking or cracking, if you feel a temperature change, no matter how subtle, run. Run for your life. The autumn leaves were orange and red, and danced in the cool breeze as the sun quickly disappeared under cloud cover. The days were getting shorter and shorter, and I knew in time that winter would set in, and I would have to spend most of my time indoors. I hated spending all my time inside, all winter, and I wanted to get out and do things. I mean, really, just anything. So, high school just let out for fall break, and I never had anything to do over the breaks that we had, but I had an idea of what to do over break this time. I decided that I was going to go to this abandoned shack that I had come across while hiking in the woods one day. The shack, while not completely dilapidated, was still left to abandon. It was surrounded by bushes and trees and all sort of ivy crawled up the outside walls. Luckily for me, it was only a few mile hike from my house into the woods. I wanted to go in and explore the day I had found it, but I wasn't prepared. Plus, my mom called and said to get home because it was almost time for dinner. After I had dinner, I decided I was going to lie and tell my mom I was going to go to a friend's house for the night, and I grabbed my stuff and headed out the door. Now, I guess I didn't have to do this in hindsight, but I knew it was going to be a tough hike in the woods, and it would probably take a few hours. Come to think of it, I was feeling really good and confident that night, so hiking in the woods at night alone didn't cross my mind as a bad thing. I mean, really, what could happen? So, there I was, walking into the woods, beside my house in the direction of the shack. Now, the shack was a few miles into the woods. It would be a while before I would get there. I got my phone and earbuds out of the bag that I had brought with me. I plugged my headphones in, went to my playlist, and selected the song My World by the Sick Puppies, and I just started singing along as I was walking. And after a few songs later, I was on a deer trail that I sometimes use when I was in these woods, and dark trees hung over my head, and a light flicker of lightning danced in between the falling autumn leaves. It was about to rain. As I took my earbuds out of my ears, the wind started to pick up, stripping the trees of more blood-red leaves. A few more minutes later, the wind died down, and a light drizzle started to fall from the sky. I was still in a good mood, however. Nothing was going to stop me from going on an adventure. Surprisingly, 
the rest of the walk was relatively relaxing. The rain stopped, and it turned into a calm evening. A few steps after looking at my phone's Google Map app, I heard an unusual cry. A shrill screeching that sounded similar to that of a fox. However, it had a baritone undertone to it, so I knew instantly it wasn't one. A little while later, I saw the tire that I saw when I first came across the shack, so I knew I was close. A few minutes passed, and I found an old gravel trail that was probably used as some sort of walkway when the house was lived in years ago. From there, the abandoned house came into view. I held up my mag light to the ancient structure. Ah, just as I remembered it. Gray walls covered with dying ivy, a rusting tin roof, and warped glass windows. I walked up to the door, and I knocked first just in case, even though I knew it was vacant. I got no answer so I grabbed the knob, slammed my body into the door to bust it open, and the wood was so old and rotted that it wasn't hard to break open and I just walked in. The place looked like it hadn't been touched in years, and I began looking around it. There was a stove in the kitchen, and a couch in the living room, and three other rooms. There appeared to be decayed food on the floor of the kitchen, and the smell just made me want to vomit, but I continued looking. I heard the sound of a twig breaking, but I brushed it off, thinking it was probably just an animal or that maybe I just stepped on something. So, I went into one of the three other rooms. It was a bedroom, and it was rather well maintained. The bed and closet were still there, the doors of the closet were still intact, although they had cracks in them. The house was surprisingly kept well on the inside. Maybe the decay of the outside hadn't touched the inside after all these years. It did smell really bad though, like an animal carcass on the side of the road, that moldy, earthy, mineral smell. Not that I go around smelling animal carcasses or anything, but there was this one time. Anyway, I digress. There was one thing that surprised me about the bedroom. There was a faded stain on the floor, and at the time I thought, well, this shack is old, so the roof probably leaks when it rains, so it was probably just a water stain, and the rust from the roof probably just stained it red. Just when I had that thought, I heard something walk into the house. I thought it was probably just another animal, but then I heard a faint cough. I knew instantly right then and there that it was a person. I freaked out and quietly got into the closet and gently closed the door. There was a horrible smell in the closet. I looked down, searching for the cause of the smell. There was a dead deer with its head cut off, and I really couldn't tell at the time, but something else was attached to it. I was stuck in there, and the silence was almost unbearable. It was so quiet that I could hear maggots writhing in the belly of the deer. I tried to keep calm and swallow the vomit that made its way into my throat, and that's when I heard the footsteps. It sounded like they weren't too far from the room that I was in. Whatever it was, was dragging something heavy, and I could tell that they were struggling by the way they were breathing and heaving. The footsteps and dragging noises finally came to a stop only a few feet outside of the closet that I was hiding in. 
I heard it moan and heave something onto the bed. The bed creaked with the weight placed on it. It took a little time, but I found a crack in the closet door, and I peeked through it to witness what I assumed was a body, but I couldn't really tell. It looked like human flesh with hair, but it was all mangled and distorted. It finally opened a hole, right next to a hair patch, and let out the same scream that I heard in the woods earlier. I gasped when I got to finally see the man next to this gelatinous, flesh creature. He was a huge monstrosity of a man, with patches of hair missing from his head and a gigantic knife in his hand. He slowly raised the knife to his other arm and cut himself deep, screaming in agony as he did so. He raised his bleeding arm and flexed, blood squirting at the screeching mass of flesh on the bed. And suddenly, a blue veiny tongue stuck out of the creature on the bed and it started to lick up the blood. The man that was standing beside the creature eventually collapsed. And that's when I decided to run out of there. I ran past the passed out man on the ground, not even bothering to look at the grotesque creature on the bed. I slammed through the front door and down the gravel path as fast as I have ever ran in my entire life. I eventually made it home running almost the entire time. I had marks and scratches on my face and hands where twigs and bushes hit me on the run back. And out of breath, I opened the back door to my house. And to my surprise, the police were sitting in the kitchen, talking with my mother. Apparently, my mom called my friend's house after trying to get a hold of me on my cell phone. My friend basically ratted me out, saying I wasn't with her, and my mom got really worried and called the police. I told them about the shack that I ventured out to, and they went out to check it. They found the shack, and they searched it. But they didn't find the man on the floor, or any creature or anything on the bed. They did find, however, a large amount of blood on the bed, and a decaying deer corpse with a human head attached to it in the closet. They spent weeks at that shack in the woods behind my house, recovering 15 bodies altogether. They were everywhere in the rooms I didn't go into. They were in the walls. They were even under the floorboards. But all those bodies didn't scare me one bit. And perhaps I'm a bit of a psychopath for not being scared. Or perhaps I'm scared of that flesh monster and its blood bag. Still roaming the woods behind my house. I work as a police officer on the eastern coast of America. The following is something I need to get off my chest. Here's my story. Both me and my partner Hartman had just bought our freshly microwaved dinners from the local quick stop, and we were heading back to our patrol vehicle when we got the dispatch. All posts and patrols be advised, we received a call from one Charles Fredrickson. All closest patrols will respond. Now, as an officer, you get to know your desk sergeant's voice. Bland and dull usually meant a nuisance call, whereas fast-paced and coupled with sporadic series of words meant an urgency. 
Her voice that night, well, it was unfamiliar from what I was used to. She sounded confused and stayed vague. Time to put our game faces on. I heard a voice perk up next to me. That enthusiastic tone could only belong to Hartman, my partner. Both him and I were fairly new to this police thing. To give us credit, we've been on the force for a little over a year. Though, sadly, time doesn't change whether or not you're fresh blood. Only experience can do that. I glanced over at him before jogging over to our vehicle and shouting, Yeah, I think our uh, address is uh, out in the swamps. Go ahead and pull up a map and uh, tell me where to drive. Hartman wiggled one of his hands into his uniform pocket, balancing his food and his other, before pulling out his phone. I hopped into our vehicle and waited for him. He clambered into his seat, phone in one hand and food half in his other and half spilling onto the floor. Got it up, Hartman said, showing me his phone screen. This place, whatever it was, was out in the swamps. God only knew where we were heading. I turned our vehicle in drive and headed off, keying the radio. This is Police 4. We're 26 minutes away. Are there any closer patrols? There was a brief silence before she replied. Negative. All other patrols are conducting training at the station. Bullshit. If there's any cops out there who read this, you know if you hear that other patrols are doing training at 10 p.m. at night and you're the newest patrol. What they really mean is all other patrols are taking a break at the station and can't be bothered to respond to any non-emergencies. Those pricks left us out to dry on this one. I swallowed my annoyance and responded, I copy. What's the emergency? Once again, another pause. Have your partner call the desk? Her tone seemed off again. Whatever this was had weirded her out. After Hartman was done shoving his food into the back seat, he made the call. She's saying she got a call from someone named Charles Fredrickson. He seemed erratic and fidgety. He said he wanted the government to come and talk to him. She's got no idea what that meant, just for us to be careful and keep in touch. As I headed away from our suburbia and into the boonies, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. The night air seemed unnaturally heavy and boggy. I'll grant the fact that we were heading closer to the swamps as an explanation, but sometimes you know when things aren't right. A few minutes down the forest at an empty road, Hartman spoke up. At the next fork in the road, take a right. The way that would take us led straight into the woods, swamp and marshland engulfed the land out there. Even the trees had somewhat submerged into the bile that made up the wetlands. Any hope for a walkway, bikeway, or boatway was not existent this far down. The only bridge from us to our destination was the unkempt and dirty old road that we found ourselves on. My eyes took a venture out the window to verify my thoughts, and they of course confirmed that had nothing but pitch-colored darkness lay outside our doors. Our headlights were the only sign of life in the abyss of blackness that had surrounded us. I tried to shake off the creep that started forming down my spine and shifted my focus into driving. Then Hartman spoke up. Hey Morgan, you think it's a bit weird that there's no lights up ahead? We're going to a residence, right? I bit the inside of my cheek. A bad habit that I could never break. I could only answer him with a shrug. Our journey continued in silence until the distant sound of thunder echoed through the void around us. All I could think of was how the sound of nature was better than the soundless emptiness we had found ourselves in. It says we'll be reaching the end of the road in about a minute, Hartman chimed. He was pressed against his window, squinting his eyes trying to see our destination approaching. I joined him in his search and reduced my speed. I prayed I wouldn't launch myself off the road right into the murky water next to us. It was because of that thought that I slowed down drastically, and thankfully so. I almost didn't see the house crop up right in front of us. No, actually house isn't the right word. It was a, uh, it was a manor. A large stone mansion surrounded by swamplands and out in the middle of nowhere. What the hell is this place? Hartman asked next to me. 
arching his head upwards trying to judge the mansion's size. The first few specks of rain began to hit our windshield. I don't know. I never knew a place like this existed out here. I mumbled while gazing at the stone structure in front of us. Eventually, Hartman and I gathered up the courage and stepped out of our vehicle. When we closed our doors, the sound exploded infinitely outward into the silent marsh. Immediately, we turned on our flashlights, the beams of light being the only haven we felt. We aimed them toward the residence, and immediately something about the house was off. Morgan, where are the windows? I felt his words slither down my spine like a frozen snake. He was right. There were no windows. No windows, no cars. Only a single massive red door at the entrance. Let's circle around back and uh, see if we can find something, I suggested, letting my teeth scrape the inside of my cheek again. Every fiber of my being wanted to call back up, but there was no way in hell I'd risk waiting. Everyone, especially cops, have this danger sense that goes off in bad scenarios. That sense was buzzing hard right now. The rain began to fall harder, drenching us in thick, humid air. Hartman volunteered to look out back behind the house for any other windows or doors. He came up empty-handed. No sounds or signs of life, he said quietly, barely audible above the rain. As bad feelings go, and this place is a mother load. I nodded in response before radioing into the desk, and uh, this is when shit gets weird. If you try and use a radio that's out of range, it beeps loudly and won't let you make the transmission. That didn't happen. Our words went through, but we got no reply. Well, no real reply anyway. In response to us, we heard the constant sound of static come over the radio, signifying that something was blocking us out, keying the transmissions from everywhere but that source. We tried to go to our secondary means of communications, our phones. They were, of course, out of service. I wanted to hop back inside our patrol vehicle and wait for backup, but that could take upwards of an hour or more without us radioing it in. Besides, someone made a call to us. Someone was inside that bricked up building and we needed to at least knock and see if they were okay. So me and Hartman agreed to at least walk up to the door and see if anyone inside would answer it. We crept toward the door, stepping on the wooden and dilapidated stairs at the porch on our way up. I knocked on the wood, trying to be louder than the thunder that began to sound in the skies above us. Hartman clutched his sidearm. Uh, no response. I knocked again, and we waited. Ten seconds went by and nothing. Ten more, and silence. I was on my last ten-second count when we heard the gunshot. One loud pop echoed just barely through the thick wooden door. Police procedure for an active shooter involves rushing inside, heading straight to the threat and neutralizing it. That's what we tried to do. I put my hand around the metallic door handle and twisted, a pistol drawn. Hartman followed right beside me as we charged into the darkness inside that was waiting for us. I can't describe the smell that hit us adequately enough. It was musty and thick. The air smelled of fluids that either belonged inside of someone's body or inside of a bedroom, not displayed openly in the foyer. As soon as both of our feet hit the wooden floors of the interior, the door behind us slammed shut. Shit! Check the door! I'll keep eyes on in the house! I growled. I saw Hartman's flashlight whip back towards the door as mine remained forward and steadfast. We were in some sort of mudroom that led to the foyer. I heard him fiddle with the doorknob and tried to shoulder check it open, but I could tell it wasn't budging. This door is spring locked and hell, it looks like it's got a magnetic strip on the top and bottom. I swallowed hard. Our voices washed through that home like a tidal wave. If this was a trap, whoever was inside knew exactly where we were. We stood in silence for a while. I think we were both expecting a grand reveal. A few shots fired in our direction, some psycho on psychotics running towards us, but we got none of that. 
we stood in near total silence. The only other sound besides our shallow breathing was the sound of dripping coming from the main room in front of us. There was also a strange red dust that seemed to flow endlessly in the air. Hello, I called out, directing my voice toward the sound of the dripping. Is anyone in there? The sound of a chair being dragged above us answered my voice. I felt my body tense up. Someone must be on the second floor. I mumbled towards Hartman. He now stood by my side. With his company, I felt strong enough to venture forward into the foyer. The dripping got louder. As soon as we passed through the entryway, we saw what made the dripping noise. An old man sat in a chair facing us, head tilted to one side. His glazed over eyes were the first to greet us. The second was the pistol laying on the floor next to him. The dripping came from the blood that slowly trickled down his face, careening itself over the edge of his nose and onto the hardwood floor below him. It seemed like he had killed himself. Charles? I heard Hartman repeat to himself, This isn't Charles. This is Mr. Woodshaw. I looked back to the body. Mr. Woodshaw was a local multi-millionaire who disappeared nearly 30 years ago. His family had founded our town. Sure enough, the body looked just like him. What do we do? Hartman whispered to me before pausing and adding in, What's in his hand? A note was crumbled up in his palm. I knew I shouldn't touch it. I knew this could be a crime scene, but I was scared. I wanted answers, so Hartman and I approached the old man's body and took it from his lifeless hands. Press the button on the stairs. That's all it read. As soon as the last word rattled off inside my brain, I heard the sound of something being dragged above us toward the stairs the note had mentioned. I dropped the paper and pulled my pistol and flashlight up to the top of the stairs. I swear I saw a pale, thin hand point toward the bottom step before retracting itself around the corner and disappearing. We need to find a way out of here, Hartman said. I wanted to ask him if he had seen what I did, but I didn't want to feed into whatever paranoia was consuming me. Instead, I walked over to the bottom step and felt around. Sure enough, just under the lip of the stair was what felt like a button. I clicked it. Welcome to the Fredrickson Manor, your new paradise, the cheery voice of a younger Mr. Woodshaw echoed out through the main room from the walls. I apologize, I can't be here to greet you in person. I have business to attend to. Feel free to enjoy each other's company while I'm gone. I'll see you shortly. The audio seemed out of place in this barren home. I couldn't help but wonder what had happened here. Immediately after the audio and the speakers spun forward, clearly to a new recording, an older and more distraught Mr. Woodshaw spoke up. Are you still watching? I could feel it in the air. Am I part of your experiment now? For the first time in 30 years, I could think clearly, and I want out. There was a brief pause as Mr. Woodshaw cried to himself. The front door can be opened with a switch in my office upstairs. I need you to click it. I've done enough. A static came over the speakers as it cut out. Should we go? Hartman asked, looking toward the stairs. I don't see why not. We need to get out of here. Hartman walked up to me and we both slowly crept up the steps. I heard the sounds of footsteps scattering below us like rats. Neither of us had the courage to look back at what made the noise. The top of the stairs presented a hallway that we passed through. We passed by several unassuming doorways, some open and some closed. We were only focused on one. At the end of the hallway lay a thick metal door painted the same red as the entrance. We were willing to take the gamble and say, that was his office. My eyes eventually traveled to the floor we were walking on. The light from my flashlight illuminated the stains of various liquids on the hardwood floors, and several patches reddish and alien looking mold started cracking through the wooden boards. How long did uh, Mr. Woodshaw live here? Hartman whispered toward me. Too long, I'd guess. 
I replied. We managed to close the distance to the door. I could have sworn at multiple points in the darkness of the open doorways I saw outlines of things, shadows of people, watching us. This was no longer a job Hartman and I could do alone. We needed to get out and get back up. We reached the metallic door and pressed it open. Inside was a den. This was the only place in the entire home that wasn't layered in red dust and stained with fluids. Old TV monitors had lined the walls along with stacks of notes inside bookcases. Every TV was on, but radiated darkness except for one. The one that showed us with our flashlights entering Mr. Woodshaw's office. He was monitoring every room in his house from here. Come on, let's look for that switch. Hartman mumbled as he pushed past me. Even though he had claimed to have wanted to find the switch, the first place he searched was stacks of notes on Mr. Woodshaw's desk. Hardly a help. I ignored my own curiosity and began scrounging the walls and TVs for anything that could be flipped. I ended up finding a whole switchboard dedicated to turning on and off lights in any given room. I flipped on one and saw something. I wish I never did. There was a small storage room filled with the bodies of infants. Some bones, some decaying, but none fresh. I suppose that was some sort of respite. I quickly flicked the light switch back off before doing a double take. I thought I had briefly noticed that someone was standing in the corner of that room. I flicked the light back on and sure enough, there she was. I don't know if calling her a person would be respectful to the rest of us or not. I know how that sounds, but a person has something to them, something more. This thing, pale as pale can be, just stood there staring at the dead children. Her face seemed pleased in a strange way. Pleasured, it was when I noticed her hand placement over her groin that I flipped the light back off. Who the fuck could do that to dead children? I flipped another switch and saw a bedroom. A dead woman lay naked and abused on a bed as several men stood next to her, faces staring into the camera and genitals fully exposed. Their faces were contorted in a feral grin, the sides of their mouths crumbling from dehydration. I flipped the light off and tried one more room, a chapel. Inside was a full congression of people, all were silent and still as the grave, just like all the others. They sat in pews and stared forward at the podium. The red dust flowed free in this room, obscuring almost every detail. I tried hard to see the images painted on the walls, but couldn't make out what they meant. Jesus. I heard Hartman mumble, breaking my gaze. He had placed his hands over his mouth in disgust. I looked back to the screen to see the whole congression now standing on their feet. Their heads were twisted toward the camera in disgusted snarls. Before I could process what was happening, they began to sprint out of the room. From the hall outside, I heard the sound of doors being slammed open and footsteps clamoring toward our direction. I heard the sounds of dozens of feet sprinting towards us. I ran to the door and braced it shut. I looked for a lock, but instead I noticed a magnetic strip above my head. Hartman, is there a way to lock this door? I yelled as a thud hit the other side of the metal behind me. Hartman looked up from the notes and saw me plastered against the door. He quickly understood what was happening. He scrounged the desk for a switch as another body slammed against the metal, pushing me forward. Hurry! I screamed, my voice shaking. I got it! I got it! Hartman shouted from under the desk. I felt the door slam and seal behind me. I took several deep breaths and fell to my knees. What was that? He asked. I shook my head in dismissal and pointed to the TV monitors. Hartman rushed over and flipped on the hallway light. With a quick gasp, he flipped the light back off. What the hell are those things? He asked. I shook my head. I don't know. Morgan, some of those things shouldn't be moving. I said, I don't know. I felt my voice rise in anger. Then, there was a silence. Even the other side of the door was just as quiet as it had been when we entered. 
I'm going to read more. Maybe it'll tell us something. Uh, I could use your help. He tossed me some files off Mr. Woodshaw's desk and continued reading. I flipped through the notes. I don't know how to explain what I read. This place. This home. It was never meant to be a real home. Woodshaw built it to experiment with people. He called it the Pleasure House. He invited people from all over the country for a week's visit, fed them a feast every night, gave them whatever they wanted, provided the most extreme entertainment, including murder, and dealt with whatever responsibility that popped up for the guests. These people were free to leave whenever they wanted. They never did. They became addicted to this lifestyle. All fun, no responsibility. The most disturbing activity was what they did when they became pregnant. They'd give birth and toss the baby into a room to die. That doesn't even get into all the rapes and murders that happened here. Hell, even the servants who brought the food every day fell into the madness and joined in. Without food being brought and these things ended up eating each other, living in darkness and becoming feral. It was at this point Woodshaw locked them up. For 30 years they've lived here. Some of these people are generations down from the original guests of this house. God only knows how they survived. There was also a mention of some sort of drug that they filtered in through the air ducts. Who they are, we never found out. Some sort of affiliate of Woodshaws that were interested in this experiment themselves, we'd guess. Now, if the guests' choices were due to the extreme freedoms without responsibilities, or from the drug in the air, I couldn't say. But these things, they weren't like us anymore. That much I knew. For the next half hour, Hartman flipped through notes with me. He continued to seem more and more distant with every page. Finally, he just slammed the stack of papers in his hand down and reached under the seat of Mr. Woodshaw's chair. I heard a switch flip. I heard the sounds of pattering footsteps running off down the hall from behind the metallic door. For thirty minutes those things stood in darkness, not making a sound while waiting for us. I couldn't imagine what would have happened if we opened the door sooner. What did you do? I asked him. I opened the front door, he said. His tone emotionless, we can leave. But what about those things? I asked. Hartman's features were frozen. They left. It took some coaching, but eventually Hartman talked me into leaving. We walked through the empty halls once again, this time. No shadows moved in the darkness. Mr. Woodshaw's body was gone. I'm not sure if those things took him, or if he was never dead. I tried not thinking about it. The storm outside had passed, leaving the swamp's water risen. The thin road, now, would barely be able to fit our patrol vehicle, but we made do. As soon as we made some distance away, our radios began to work again. We called in for the casualties at the house, and dispatch told us to go back to the scene. We declined. They weren't too happy. What haunts me about this, that there was only one road leading away from that house, yet we didn't see one of those things on the path. The only other way across was the swamp, and imagining them lurking off the side of the road as we drove past gave me chills. To be honest, the main reason I'm bringing this up is the fact that crime has risen in our town, and not the normal stuff either, but hard stuff, rapes, murders. Not one victim that managed to survive knows who the attackers were, just that they grinned the whole time and looked like they had never seen sunlight. I'm worried that Hartman and I are the reason these people are getting hurt. The federal lawmen are becoming increasingly interested in our town, and before they made us local guys shut up, I wanted to release what I knew. My friends and I used to do a lot of geocaching after our senior year in high school. For those of you who don't know what geocaching is, 
It's essentially a worldwide scavenger hunt. People will select sites and conceal a geocache somewhere unobtrusive, then post GPS coordinates on geocaching websites where other searchers can download the cords and locate the cache. Usually, people who have found the object, often it's a chest or something hollow, will leave a note or a small personal memento for future searchers to find and appreciate. There are several types of geocaches, and most of them are thematic in nature. This story begins when my friends and I decide to try a series of purportedly haunted locales within an hour's drive of our hometown. It began innocently enough. Most of the sites had spooky backstories that were, of course, entirely fabricated. So we had a great time scaring the piss out of each other and generally creeping ourselves out. We'd begun searching after the sun had set to enhance the creep factor, but around midnight, most of our large group had dwindled off and gone their separate ways. When we reached our last cord, there was just myself, Rebecca, Kevin, and Evan left, and we were determined to knock it off our list. Rebecca was our guide for the night. She was in charge of putting in the coordinates and reading us the backstory behind each site. So, while I drove, she began reading about the last one out loud to the rest of us. Now, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something along the lines of Henkel Asylum, constructed in the early 1900s. The James Henkel Asylum was built to house a burgeoning population of the criminally insane. Men who had committed vile crimes, rape, murder, torture, without signs of remorse, were deemed mentally unstable and sent to this facility for further study and rehabilitation. Once committed, very few criminals were ever released back into society, and those that were usually had been given frontal lobotomies, a popular experimental procedure at the time or electroshock therapy, both of which rendered the patient nearly brain-dead, capable of performing only rudimentary tasks. Stories Contemporary visitors to the asylum report hearing banging noises, cell doors opening and closing, and hearing cackling laughter that is abruptly cut short. It was pretty standard fare compared to the rest of the sites we'd visit that night, and we naturally had a good time psyching each other out for the next 15 minutes while I drove us to the asylum. We'd all heard about it. It was in our local area after all, and we knew it had been condemned and abandoned since as long as any of us could remember. So we figured It'd be a great place to run around and be reckless teenagers without risk of getting yelled at by the cops. When we finally arrived, it looked like something straight out of those creepy, cheesy, B-rated movies they show on sci-fi. Chain-link fence with barbed wire around the perimeter, two guard towers flanking the main gate, which was, of course, chained and locked shut with a big no trespassing sign hanging from it. The asylum itself was decrepit, looking like it hadn't been touched for decades, which was surprising since we grew up in a pretty nice area where the lawmakers try to keep everything looking spiffy for the tourists. Needless to say, we promptly ignored the sign on the front gate and hauled ourselves over. Cameras, and GPS in hand, we walked toward the asylum. Now, given our attitude towards the previous sites, you've probably gathered that I'm somewhat of a skeptic. I believe that there are paranormal things that can't be explained. Well, yeah, anyway. But I'm not exactly summoning demons in front of a bathroom mirror. So when we opened up the main door to the asylum, I dismissed the cold burst of wind as just 
stale, pent-up air rushing out after being trapped inside for so long. My friend's bravado, however, quickly disappeared, and they began shuffling their feet nervously at the entrance, hesitant to cross that invisible threshold. I took point, shivying them along with prodding taunts, and eventually everyone was inside. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Things were relatively clean, and the entire building looked like it had been gutted. The paint was peeling, tiles popping up here and there, and the metal trim near the baseboards of the wall was in desperate need of some rust be gone. But aside from that, the place was entirely empty. No crazy-ass chairs with leather straps, no gurneys laying haphazardly around, just an old reception desk and two hallways leading off to the different wings. We explored for a few minutes, freaking ourselves out whenever we heard an old pipe rattle or rat squeak, but otherwise it was relatively uneventful. Our fears safely suppressed by the presence of each other. We began to get more adventurous, opening doors and peeking inside. The rooms were all empty, of course. Whatever company had been contracted to clear the place out did a pretty decent job of removing any creepy decor. Bravado, returning by the minute, Evan and Kevin dropped back without Rebecca or me noticing. They began running around, making noises to try to scare us. Which I'm not gonna lie, it worked until I realized they were gone and probably the cause of all the racket. Then returned laughing and breathless to a decidedly paler Rebecca. She seemed to be a lot more put off by the whole place than the rest of us. Or at least, she didn't hide it as well. She quietly suggested we leave. Not to be outdone by the other guys of the group, I told her she was more than welcome to wait in the car if she wanted, but I was going to stick around for a few more minutes. Exasperated, but defeated, she finally caved and followed us where the GPS was leading. The second floor. This is where I started to feel genuinely scared. Before, I was just kind of creeped out. But there was something about that whole floor that literally gave me shivers. Despite it being a warm summer night, we started opening doors like before, but we were all a lot more sober about it. I guess I wasn't the only one who was feeling weird. Finally, about midway through the hall, we opened the door to a room, and there, lying in the middle of the floor, was an honest-to-God straitjacket. I'm not bullshitting you. Every other room was devoid of objects, but there it was, a fucking straitjacket in the middle of the floor of some random-ass room in a condemned mental asylum. We all kind of looked at each other with raised eyebrows, as if to say, uh, guys, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And of course, trying to be a macho man to show off for Rebecca, I piped up with the most ridiculous idea I could think of at the time. Dude, I'm gonna put it on. Years of horror flicks and creepy pasta should have trained me to not put on the creepy straitjacket in the creepy hall in the creepy asylum. But teenage dump fuckery won over, and once the words were out, I couldn't just wuss out. Nobody said anything. They just kind of looked at me expectantly, waiting to see if I'd follow through with my boast. Determined not to be called a pussy for the remainder of the night, I walked forward into the room and bent down to pick up the moth-ridden restraining device. As I got closer, though, I noticed it wasn't moth-ridden at all, but was actually in pretty decent condition. You know, that is compared to the rest of the place, which, as I've mentioned, was in shambles. I mean, 
It had a few stains here and there, but it didn't really smell, and it seemed intact enough to put on. As soon as I picked it up though, I got this overwhelming sense of dread. You know, that drop in the pit of your stomach right as you go over the lip of a roller coaster? That feeling in the bottom of your gut that says, I'm gonna die, I just know it. Yeah, well, I got that really strong and I totally ignored it. My desire not to die was outweighed as it is often in teenagers, by my need to look cool for my friends. So, I slipped my hands in the sleeves, one at a time, until it hung loosely from my shoulders. Now, if you've ever seen a straitjacket, you know that you can't tie it up yourself. The whole point is to essentially cross your arms across your chest and tie the sleeves behind your back to prevent who's ever inside from moving their arms, presumably to stop from hurting themselves or others. So as I stood there in the middle of the room, I called out to Rebecca. Hey Becca, help me tie this thing off. She looked, if you'll excuse the pun, pale as a ghost. But she managed to squeak out, I don't think this is a good idea, but again, after some prodding and encouraging, I convinced her to begin tying the sleeves behind my back. Evan and Kevin just stood in the doorway, expressions a mix of admiration and incredulity. At that point in time, I felt like a badass for about three seconds. As soon as Rebecca finished up the last lace, the door to the cell slammed shut right in Kevin and Evan's faces. I never felt a breeze, and when I asked them later, both of them fervently denied closing it themselves. Skeptic that I am, I still chalk it up to us leaving the front door open and changing air pressures and all that, but it scared the piss out of us nonetheless. Then I felt a pressure on my chest like someone was sitting on it, or as if someone was pulling the sleeves tighter behind me, and it began to get harder to breathe. I couldn't even summon enough air to whisper, much less call out for help. My vision narrowed to tiny specks, and I swear I heard someone laughing shrilly as I neared unconsciousness. The pressure increased with a sudden tug, and my world went black. When I woke up, my vision was foggy, or at least I thought it was, until I realized it wasn't just foggy. It was dark, like staring through a lens that's been collecting soot. I blinked a few times, and the darkness wavered but didn't dissipate. Now, I passed out and blacked out before, but whenever I woke up, it was nothing like that. Either my vision gradually cleared up, or it was blurry, but never in my life have I been able to recreate the shadowy haze I saw in the asylum that night. Then, from the murky depths, two small pinpoints of light appeared a few inches in front of my face, glaring a lurid red, and a dim echo of the laughter I heard before surrounded me. As soon as they appeared, however, they were replaced by two brilliant shafts of incandescence. Evan and Kevin shining flashlights down on my face. The last thing I remember hearing before I lost consciousness was Rebecca's scream and the door banging open, which probably explains why those two were standing over me with flashlights in hand. I gradually became aware of a dull murmur that I recognized as Rebecca asking me, please, please wake up, please, please wake up, as she shook me. She just kept saying it over and over again, kept sobbing and shaking me. When my vision cleared enough, I glanced over and saw that her eyes were completely red, 
like she'd been crying for a while. Trying to muster some shred of manliness, I found myself speaking in a surprisingly calm voice, given how I was actually feeling. I remember distinctly what I said word for word. Get those fucking flashlights out of my face, you douchebags. Expecting a laugh or at least some reciprocal insults, I was kind of shocked when they just looked at each other quizzically, seemingly surprised. You're okay? You're, you're okay? Evan asked incredulously. Yeah, why the hell wouldn't I be? Becca just tied the things too tight. I couldn't breathe, so I passed out. How long was I out for anyway? I inquired. Apparently, it had been long enough for them to untie the straitjacket, allowing me to rub a hand against my face. Another shared look of disbelief. Dude, Kevin began slowly. You've been out for like 15 minutes. We were about to call 911. We kept shaking you, Evan even tried pinching you so hard he drew blood, but you wouldn't wake up. I felt a cold chill run down my spine, and the straitjacket, hanging limply from my shoulders, suddenly began to feel a bit tighter. Hastening to pull it off, I tried not to look panicked as I threw it to a corner of the room. Rebecca just sat there, still shaking and crying a little bit, and in spite of the ordeal I'd just gone through, I had enough sense to go over and try to comfort her. We left that room without a word, geocache be damned, and walked back to the car in complete silence, broken only by the occasional sniffle from Rebecca. The sun started coming up, and as I dropped everyone off at their respective homes, we said quiet goodbyes. Rebecca was the last stop before I finally made the trip home myself. Being the gentleman that I am, I walked her to her door, but she paused at the entry and looked at me in the eye. In the light of the gray dawn, I could see her eyes were still reddened from all the crying. She was very quiet, and she said, I have to ask you something. Yeah, sure, what is it? I said, half expecting another, you sure you're all right? Like I'd been getting the whole ride home. She surprised me by asking, do you know how long it took Evan and Kevin to get the door open? Her eyes held a look that I could never forget. It was raw fear. Something happened in that fraction of time between me blacking out and them getting in there that had absolutely terrified her. And seeing that look, I realized I was blacked out for 15 minutes. How long was she alone in that room? No, I replied slowly. How long? Five minutes. They say it took five minutes for them to open that stupid door. I was in there and I saw you, and I saw... She broke off, another sob stopping her mid-sentence. At that point, I didn't want to know. I still don't want to know. I gripped her by the shoulders and said firmly, Rebecca, it doesn't matter. No matter what you saw, I'm here, you're here, we're both safe, it doesn't matter. Nothing bad will happen, I promise. She just nodded numbly, opened her door, and walked inside her house. The next time I saw her, she was back to her usual self, but whenever I bring up that night to her, she freezes up and turns to stone, refusing to discuss it. I stand by what I said before. I don't know what happened in that room, and I don't ever want to know. But I still have nightmares about those two glowing red lights in the darkness. And sometimes, as I lapse into sleep, I hear faint echoes of shrill laughter following me down into the depths of unconsciousness.
It was late, round 8 p.m. For November, this meant that the shadows of the night were already engulfing the world. It wasn't cold out, though. The wind was gentle and carried with it the smells of foliage thanks to the various gardens that littered the campus grounds. I sauntered along the sidewalks while admiring the weather. I loved the night, especially when the stars were out. Unfortunately, they couldn't be seen from here even on the clearest of nights since the college was located just outside the city. A friendly squirrel suddenly crossed my path, coming mere inches to my feet before looking up at me and chattering as though I had done it a misdeed. It didn't appear frightened at all, so in a sudden motion I stomped at it. The creature, rather than skittering off, lay flat on the ground. I felt that I could possibly kneel down and pick up the creature had I wanted to. However, I had just been attending this campus for months and knew from experience that this little thing would run off just short of contact. So instead, I continued on my way. I had a destination in mind and could not be delayed any longer. Just ahead, along the outer edge of the campus, was the only woman's restroom left open at this hour. The campus itself usually shuts down early on Fridays, so I was lucky there was at least one left unlocked, especially considering I had an hour's drive home ahead of me. Quite honestly, I didn't feel like stopping at a gas station for such a purpose this late in the day. Turning the last building, I finally arrived at the lonely structure. It could have served as a concrete outhouse, in my opinion, but then again, I have no knowledge of such things. It was just a small building with a single purpose. I looked behind me as a gust of wind caught my attention. The parking lot was a few yards away, surrounded by the flat green lawn of the college. The campus buildings themselves were dark and shadowed, most of which were no longer holding classes at this time. When I saw no one there, I continued on my way. The door screamed in protest as I entered, rust-covered hinges flaking away in a flurry. The sound reverberated in the small room. As was normal for bathrooms, the floor was linoleum, the walls were a bare white, and a single yellow light illuminated the six stalls, aligning the back wall. There was only two sinks and a single roll of paper towels hanging above a trash bin. I passed by and as per usual, chose the stall beside the handicapped. I always felt bad whenever I entered the handicapped stall since it was designed for those who had trouble using the regular toilets. When I was younger, I took delight in the more spacious stall, but now I know better. Regardless of popular belief, women's restrooms don't exactly smell better than the men's room. For various reason, it always smelled worse. I would know. In high school, I had once been dared to enter every men's room on campus. I did, of course, being the daredevil I was. This time, it smelled worse as though something had died and had been left to rot in the small hanging trash box along one of the stall walls. Knowing the sort of things that would have normally been thrown in there, I didn't feel the urge to investigate and set my mind to finishing my business. It wasn't until I finished that I heard it. A slight gasping sound as though someone with asthma was in the stall beside me. Not having heard anyone enter the restroom, I did the immature thing, and I looked. I leaned forward and tilted my head until I could see under the wall to my left, allowing me to peer into the four stalls besides mine. At first, I didn't see anything. They were all empty, so I figured the sound was probably coming from the handicapped stall beside mine. 
Before I could turn my head, however, I noticed a pair of legs drop down from the stall at the far end. And that's when I realized someone had been standing on the toilet in the first stall. The legs were bare, probably meaning the owner had a dress or shorts. As for the missing shoes, I wasn't certain. People don't just wander the city shoeless. Not that I knew of, anyway. Relieved at finding the culprit, I sighed and closed my eyes, ready to sit up and leave when something else happened. A head popped down from the last stall, obviously belonging to the same person as the legs, although something had seemed off about her. She seemed to be a brunette with wild, unkempt hair. Her skin was very pale, as though she hadn't seen the light of day in years. The features on her face were more prominent, thin and shadowed. She looked rather young to be attending college, maybe a high school freshman. Either way, her cheeks and eyes were unnaturally sunken in. Her eyes, however, appeared to be pure black. Now, I was four stalls away from her and making all kinds of judgment calls on the girl when I realized I had just been caught peeping at her. This was rather embarrassing, so I immediately sat up and blushing furiously. Should I apologize? Do people do that in public restrooms, and what about her eyes? I shrugged off the last question, figuring it was just a figment of my imagination. They probably only looked that way because she was so far down and I couldn't probably see her anyway. She most likely had some really dark brown eyes or something. I stood, prepared to leave the stall and promptly walked my embarrassment off when I heard something else. Something unusual. It was a shuffling sound, as though someone was sliding under the stall walls. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, realizing how strange this situation had become. Why would she be climbing under the stalls? Was she autistic and lost? That certainly would explain her appearance. Maybe she wandered away from her guardian and decided to play in the woman's restroom? It was never locked, after all, even after hours. I decided I'd call the police and report her in case she was a missing person. I also didn't want to scare her off since she looked sickly and the poor thing was probably starving. So, resolving myself, I sat back down and leaned over only to find the girl looking at me from one stall closer. I originally was going to try and get her name but stopped dead as my eyes took in the sight of her. Her eyes were black all right, black as coal. Her skin was pale and cracked in places as though it had dried up and no longer held a drop of moisture. Her throat, which I didn't realize before, had what looked like a slit along it with some sort of dried, darkened residue along the edges. However, I couldn't make out the rest of her since it was only her head peeping out from under the stall. I could not identify the rest but at that point, I didn't want to. This thing wasn't human. Fear gripped me as I sat up. My nerves were put on edge and my breath had begun to quicken. I had felt as though my heart would pound right out of my chest if I had tried to run out of the bathroom. I would have had to run past that thing. I closed my eyes as images of it leaping on me and tearing me to shreds started to fill my head. How could I get past it? 
I don't know how long I'd sat there panicking, but I did notice when it started moving again. Although this time, I heard thumping sounds as though it were hitting the walls gently. My heartbeat skyrocketed as I had tried to remain calm, happy to have already done my business. For a moment, I considered just running past it. It was my only chance since I had no other options. Then I realized something. It stopped. I began to strain my ears to locate the creature by sound, but heard nothing. The gasping noises were gone, and I no longer heard the thing shuffling or banging along the floors and walls. Was it still there? I knew I had to look. There was a chance that it was standing by the exit now, or worse, it could be just outside my stall. I had to make up my mind quickly as I contemplated the possibilities. Eventually I manned up and took one last look under the stalls. I glanced to the left to find the thing missing. So, having unconsciously held my breath, I glanced towards the exit. Nothing. A wave of relief washed over me in time for a shuffling sound to my right to catch my attention. Before I could process what it was, I whipped my head around, fearing it to be staring back at me just inches away from the stall I never bothered to inspect, only to find a pair of hiking boots. It took me a moment to register this. There was someone in the handicap stall. When did they get here? Ah, oh, who cared? There was someone else here with me, and although I had no idea who this other person was, in the wake of that thing, I felt at ease knowing I wasn't alone anymore. As usual, my sense of relief was short-lived once I noticed the gasping sound coming from inside my stall. I froze for what seemed like an eternity before I managed to glance up. There she was. A blast of fetid air washed over me, much stronger than the original stench from before. Her face was contorted in anger. Her wild hair was knotted up and flying about her head as those dark pits sneered into my very soul. Her mouth was molded into a fierce grimace, crackling her lips and revealing rotted teeth. It was then, while looking into that monster's eyes, that I came to a revelation. It was hungry, and it wanted me. That thought was the only motivation that I needed to make a bolt for it. I slammed so hard into the stall door that the lock broke clean off as I stormed through the exit. I wanted to run to my car, to drive home, to curl up in bed and pretend it was all a bad dream, and I would have if it weren't for the girl I nearly ran into. We nearly collided, but I managed to swerve out of her path just in time. The girl was wearing a trendy mini jacket slightly torn jeans and a white tank top. She gave me a strange look before going into the restroom. <sighs> I should have said something. Maybe warned her of what awaited in there, but as I stood once more straining my ears to hear the slightest of sounds, silence fell upon me. A few more moments and I began to piece everything together. Realization flooded my thoughts as things began to make sense. Whoever was in the handicapped stall must have had their feet pulled up when I first walked in. They were probably recording the sounds, hoping for screams, or worse, they were filming me in the stall. The other girl was probably some really well-dressed actor who was there to scare the crap out of any poor soul who wandered in. Well, screw them. I turned on my heels and hurried to my car cell already out. I informed the police of the dirtbag who had been filming me in the stalls. 
I knew that filming anyone in the bathroom, prank or no, was illegal. They said they'd look into it and I was able to drive home worry-free. Oh, how I regretted that. The next day, I arrived on campus, only to find it locked down and swarming with cop cars and officers. A girl had been murdered in the women's restroom last night. Estimated time of death, 8.34 p.m. It was the girl I had run into. Apparently, there had been a series of murders in the city. A man had been spotted on some of the sites, leaving the woman's restroom where the girls were found. He would apparently wait in the handicapped stalls until the girls headed for the sink to wash their hands. Then he would come out from behind them and slit their throats. Whatever that thing was in the restroom, it had saved me. I'm breaking every single one of my rules for survival doing this, and yet, I know if I don't, I'll die of hunger in a few weeks or worse. They'll find me when I'm sleeping and carry me off to where they dwell nestled in the tunnels beneath the city. I stare into the abysmal depths below me. Nothing to make out but the now motionless escalator stairs, poking their way out of the blackness. I take one last deep breath, savor the clean, crisp February air, and make my way down to find Nate. Nate's the greatest survival tool any scavenger can have. A full-bred German Shepherd who can hear a pin drop a mile away and smell danger just as far. I found Nate in an apartment on the sixth day of the crossing, as it was termed by the media at the time. By this time, the portals had opened across the planet and every nation and all manner of demon began to cross over. I had hidden in my apartment for as long as I could, but I'd been too scared to leave to stock up on supplies in the first days and had nothing but a Nutrigrain bar and weak old milk lying in the fridge. I had no choice but to look for food. I searched the apartments around my own, tiptoeing from one to another, almost vomiting at the chaos and gore left in each one finding little or nothing in the majority of them. In number 304, where I had seen a young family with a little girl move in the month before, I found canned food and bottles of spring water. The carpet was soaked in blood, but there's no bodies. I now know where they were brought, and what was done to them, and thank God I didn't know at the time where I would have never left the building. And what I took to be the young girl's room, I heard whimpering coming from a small cabinet by the bedside. As I opened the small sliding door on it, I found a puppy, no more than 10 or 12 weeks old, immediately. I fell in love, which is a rare thing when you're standing in an apartment block, caked in the remains of its tenants. Ever since, he's been my closest companion, but no less than 20 minutes ago, one of those demonic spawn grabbed him as I was searching a broken down ambulance near the hospital. I heard a short, painful whimper and rushed out to the street, only to see the gangly, malnourished limbs 
of one of their stalkers vanish into the entrance of the subway on Groton Street. They don't kill and eat animals the way they do humans. They use them, changing them into one of their own, altering their bodies. Dogs are always favored for their tracking skills and have marked the end for many a survivor. And that's why I have to find him, if not to save him, but to release him from the torture and cruelty, that bondage that these things entail. The further I travel down, the stronger the smell of rot and decay becomes, leaving a sickly bitter taste in the back of my throat. In the past, I would have vomited or had to smear vapor rub on my upper lip to withstand it, but now I've become so accustomed to it, it's like second nature to me. Every few steps, I find myself standing on the withered remains of those who tried to escape the subway when the portals opened and they crossed over. Those who were trampled beneath the feet of the swarming crowd like rats escaping through the cracks of a burning building. A bone breaks, cracking beneath my boots every six or seven steps, and I almost stumble downwards on a few. My flashlight only shines ten or twelve feet ahead of me, and ahead of that, I'm met with an unending darkness. It's like this for ten or fifteen minutes, until finally I reach the subway floor. The smell's at its worst down here, and the floors are littered with bones and filth left over by those ungodly creatures further down the tracks. And suddenly, an inhuman shriek rings out from somewhere not far in the darkness, and my heart drops to my stomach like a ton of lead. I turn off my light and go prone to the cold tiles, my heart thumping against my ribcage in the floor beneath me. And I hear a soft pitter-patter running along the ceiling somewhere to my right and listen as it vanishes almost certainly down the tracks into the depths, perhaps to alert its demonic brethren further down. I stand up slowly almost expecting to see the creature jump out of the darkness towards me, but nothing. And after a reassuring deep breath, I make my way to the edge of the tracks, and I drop down. I twist the top of my cheap steel flashlight, and as the light begins to dim, I make my way down the tracks and towards their home towards what I almost know to be my death. The shrieks and hungry growls I hear on the way should be enough to force me to turn around and run as fast as I can back up the tunnel and back to the surface, but I can't abandon Nate because he's never abandoned me. He's always been loyal. And I know, if I do, the shame and guilt I'll hold will kill me quicker than any demon. After what seems like hours, probably no longer than 20 minutes, I come to a junction in the tracks in a train carriage, once lit up like a Christmas tree, full of commuters going about their day. It now lies decrepit and lifeless and whatever may be alive within certainly isn't human. The door of the carriage is torn open, hanging by no more than one or two of its hinges. <clears throat> I make my way past the door and into the carriage, and the first evidence of those things lies in front of me. Hundreds of prints overlapping one another in blood, from feet and paws and things that resemble hoofs like those of a pig. 
but much larger. In sum, you could make out the long claws and talons used to disembowel and dismember people like myself, people foolish enough to enter their domain. The howls are louder and closer now, no more than four, maybe five hundred meters in front of me. And I don't walk. I crouch down to make my way through the carriage. Small pieces of entrails and viscera lie strewn across the floor of the carriage. I do my best not to stand on them, but feel the stickiness of the congealed blood and fluids beneath my feet. I can hear them outside the carriages at either side the crunching of bone and soft wet sound of them devouring flesh snorts and growls as they do so i feel like standing up and running my whole body and mind are screaming but as hard as it is i ignore it and push forward slowly but surely following what i can only hope to be the steps of Nate's abductor. I see the end of the carriage in front of me and once again I go prone and begin crawling towards it, the flashlight slightly illuminating the sides of the door. When I finally make it to it, I'm met with a sight I know will never leave me until the day I die. In front of me, facing away, crouched over Nate, the figure of a stalker, the skin of its back pale with sickly green hue, sores and scabs appearing at intervals across it and its spine jutting out beneath its irregularly long body. Its gangly arms lie by its side. It reminds me of a ghoulish painting I had once seen years before, The Crossing in a basement close to my old home in Boston, by an artist called Pickman. In front of it, all around, lay numerous piles of bodies and body parts, and atop and between them, demons of all kinds, horns and snouts jutting out from between the mess, while others were covered with thick, dark fur, slick with blood of those poor souls brought down here. Near the top of the closest pile, eight or nine meters in front of me, a demon lies face down with appendages like that of an insect connected to a body which, although malformed, appears human. But all recognition of humanity fades away as I see the antenna on its head, like that of a mantis or a beetle, its head buried in the torso of what looks like the remains of a woman. At first, I think Nate is dead, but I see the slow and steady rise and fall of his chest, and I know he's alive. I then realize this is my one and only chance to save him before he's brought deeper into the tunnels towards whatever dark and evil things wait to change him into a creature like those around me for use in filling this pit with more subsidence for these things unquenchable thirsts. They don't appear to notice the dim light from the torch and I leave it on the floor beside me facing the back of the stalker. I slip my hand down to my side and to my belt and slowly withdraw the military knife from the holster beneath it. I slowly pull myself forward. Every second seems like minutes, and slowly I swing my legs down from the carriage and find myself outside. My shadow now printed on the back of the stalker in front of me. And I know one mistake, one wrong move or step and I'll alert it in every single creature around me. 
I feel the sweat begin to build on my forehead and spend a split second planning my attack. I creep to the side of the creature's back and as my foot steps forward, simultaneously, I bring one arm forward along the side of its head, my hand opened to cover the creature's mouth, as the other stabs upward, the tip of the blade slicing through the floor of its mouth and into its brain. I feel its lips move beneath my hand as it attempts to let out a cry, but it's too late, and I feel its body go limp and drop to the floor beneath me. The few seconds afterwards is the most alert I have ever been. I wait to hear the howls of revenge from the other demons sealing my fate. But they never come, and they continue to feast unbeknownst to what has happened. I slide my hand under Nate and pick him up slowly and carefully and cradle him between my chest and shoulders and slowly crawl back into the carriage. The journey back through the tunnels is twice as fast as the journey down, and although still aware of the dangers of alerting one of the creatures, I quicken my pace. Before I know it, I am hoisting myself back on the platform next to the tracks and feel Nate's body begin to twitch and jerk against me. Just as I near to the top of the escalators and feel the sunlight from the surface shine on my face, his eyes flicker and open, and he licks the side of my cheek.